event. We're all about creating diverse and inclusive dialogue on campus through events like this. I wanna take a minute and thank everyone for coming, specifically the speakers, but also our planning committee, which is Dave, Io, and Aditya. They've worked really hard to get this event going. So I'm like very proud of all the work they've done and I'm excited to see it play out. So on that note, I'm gonna pass it off to Dave to get us going, uh, but I hope you all enjoy. Thanks. Thank you so much, Madam President. Um, thanks, Maddie. Just a logistical note, we're going to be having about 45 minutes of moderated panel discussion and 15 minutes of rolling Q&A, um, which Dr. Corser will explain um, in fuller depth. As head of this event planning committee, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome all of you here today and again to extend a special thanks to our speakers, um, Val M Ramirez Mukherjee, Jake Sherman, um, and Dr. Zachary Corser of Claremont McKenna, um, and of course our planners, Aditya Bala um, and Io Cole. With that, I'll pass it over to you, Dr. Corser, and we can get started. Okay, thanks very much, Dave, and thanks to the Pomona Student Union, Maddie, Aditya, everybody who's helped in planning this event. It's a pleasure to be with you today to talk about an important subject um, that face, faces us all in the nation, and that is the future of the Republican Party. Uh, we have a, a people who are expert in uh, understanding certainly the congressional dimensions of this. We have a, a former candidate for Congress for the Republican Party, and we also have a journalist who spent a career working in Washington and, and analyzing Congress. So let me introduce them briefly and then we'll get straight into the discussion. First, I'd like to introduce Jake Sherman. Jake is a co-founder of Punchbowl News. It's a daily newsletter that covers Capitol Hill that has really quickly become an essential read in Washington. Uh, a lot of people are looking to it. They're already breaking news. In fact, some of our questions will be about some of the things that they've broken recently. Um, so he's an expert on, on covering national politics for more than a decade uh, with his uh, reporting on Congress and congressional leadership and politics of legislating. He's also a co-author of a recent book, The Hill to Die On, which was a New York Times bestseller. And he's a frequent contributor on NBC News. So Jake, pleasure to have you with us. Thanks and for having me. And we're also joined by Valerie Ramirez Mukherjee. Uh, Val uh, is a native Californian, so she's got a California connection. She grew up uh, in California, in the Bay Area, she graduated from UC Berkeley. She has a, an impressive academic resume. She has a master's in public affairs from Columbia. She has an MBA uh, from Wharton. And she spent a career working in finance and technology. But she's also uh, been someone who's been involved both in electoral and legislative politics. And that interest brought her to run as a Republican candidate for Congress from Illinois' 10th district. And for those of you who aren't from Chicago area, it covers uh, the suburbs of North Chicago, and, and she challenged a, a two-term Democratic incumbent. So she's just come out of the fray from 2020 and has uh, a lot to tell us and a lot of perspective on the future of the party, her experience, and, and uh, thinking about uh, Congress in particular, but our national politics in particular. So Fal, thank you very much for joining us, and let's get right to the discussion. So Jake, uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't try to treat you like an insider, and I want to get some insider information from you if I can. Um, you know, we see a lot of lockstep votes in Washington amongst the Republican Party. They do present, I think, a pretty united front uh, as congressional leadership in public. Um, but I, I can, you know, when I'm reading between the lines, I hear journalists saying all the time, you know, behind the scenes, uh, Republicans, elected Republicans, tell a different story. They, they say they're troubled by the direction that their party's taken since 2016. So I mean, in private conversations that you've heard, you know, sort of in the, the corridors, um, you know, what, what have you heard about concerns that uh, Republicans have about the direction of their party? And, and why don't these things really air out in public? Well, uh, thank you very much for having me, um, and uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity. A few thoughts, and actually, I, I'd say, I'd say, uh, Valerie is a great guest to have here because I would, I, I'll, I'll use, I'll use the district she ran in um, as a parable, kind of, for the direction of the party. And I see her nodding her head, probably not happily, but nodding her head. Um, so, a few things: a a members of Congress go home and they faced constituencies that either from 2016 to 2020 that either said, why aren't you standing closer to Trump? Why, and and uh, if you acted a certain way or you went home and you heard, why aren't you standing up more to Trump? 
Um, the, the districts that we have in this country are extraordinarily polarized, extraordinarily so. There's about five or six districts in America, and that's not a, um, a, uh, an exaggeration. There's just a handful of districts in America that are um, uh, competitive. The, many of the other districts have, uh, have fallen away. The district that Valerie ran in, uh, if my memory serves me well, uh, was represented by Bob Dold for uh, several years in the early 2010s, I guess that's what we could call it. Uh, and and then uh, Republicans quickly became uh, not competitive there because of Donald Trump um, and because of the new turn of the Republican Party. I, I would say that by and large, the incentive structure to speak out against Trump and to speak out uh, and, and voice your true um, hesitancies or your true, uh, 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 I'm trying to think of a gentle word here, your true skepticisms of Donald Trump's behavior in the last decade or so um, uh, is not there. That that incentive structure doesn't exist. You either have to be really close to him or, or just completely against him. And we've seen what has happened to people who speak out against him. Uh, practically every statement that Donald Trump makes uh, is about Liz Cheney, the Republican from Wyoming, who um, has spoken out against against the president or the former president. Um, so I think Donald Trump just has a grip on this party, unlike any political figure we've seen in our lives. And um, I think basically the basic answer is, is the, in, the the incentive structure doesn't exist. I think that's the basic the basic answer. Um, and I think that's I'm not sure how to fix that. I think that it's a combination of. Um, I think, and I am not a partisan. I, I am the farthest thing from a partisan. I hate everybody equally is what I tell people. Um, I, uh, um, I think that one statement I can make and I feel comfortable making is that the redistricting process in this country is broken and I don't know how to fix it. I think that, um, and, and you see this in California, it's, it's a nonpartisan redistricting commission, which is, um, uh, equally broken or, or maybe not equally but also broken to a certain extent so i think all of the the mix of all of those all of those things um uh just lead to a a uh a political system that's not healthy i would say is the best way to say it okay i, I want to remind the the audience if you have questions during our conversation please submit them to uh, aditya who's one of our who's now a co-host and and is one of the people who's uh, present here on the broadcast so as you think of questions, uh, send them to him. And then in the last few minutes, we'll uh, address your questions. So please feel free to submit as we're talking. Um, Jake, I just quick follow up about this. Um, you know, people behind the scenes uh, may dislike Trump. Maybe they can't talk about it because of the electoral costs of doing so. But there's also, I think, some turnover that we're seeing between what, we, what could be considered more establishment Republicans you know, Roy Blunt comes to mind, who's stepping down in Missouri. And there's a new class of Republicans, it seems, that are stepping in uh, to run. We've seen, you know, uh, candidates in Ohio, Missouri stepping up that seem sort of very unlike uh, and much very unlike old Republicans and very much more like MAGA Republicans. Yep. So, I mean, are That's you right. see, I mean, do you think, do you see these incoming members, if they get elected, permanently reshaping the party? I mean, do we really see a a, a uh, transition point here with Trump to a different congressional Republican. Yeah, I think I think that the idea that the question of um, when is the party going to abandon Trump is just not an operative question. I just I don't I don't see that at any. Again, I don't see the incentive structure, and I think that the party is is reshaping itself in um, in his image. Uh, and I don't know what what if anything would stop that. I don't I don't see anything stopping that. So the answer to your question is, yes, I don't see any district in America where being a where being Adam Kinzinger or um, Liz Cheney or a, a traditional, you know, country club Republican is a is is a is a a a. a, a a point in your favor. I don't, I just, I, 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 so the answer to your question is yes. I think the, the party is absolutely re reshaping itself in Donald Trump's image. Well, you know, let's talk, uh, Val, let's bring you into the conversation here. Um, 
as somebody nope. who is actually a Republican and who yep. has run for public office. <laughs> and was exactly. In a long time ago. So I have a yeah. different opinion, right? And this is why I often say I have my purple, uh, you know, here I'm a purple, I call myself a purple Republican because when I got involved in politics in the 90s, they are <clears> the Bay <throat> Area. So you had mentioned the schools before. I need to tell people I'm a first generation college student. So raised by a single parent mom, Mexican and white, right? Lived paycheck to paycheck, almost homeless. And that took one class when I was in junior college at Diablo Valley College in the Bay Area, that was political science. I'd never taken political science before. My family, my mom didn't talk about that. And I loved it, but I was fortunate in the mid nineties, I was able to pick up the phone because there was a two party system. My elected official was Congressman George Miller. I called his office. I don't remember what I asked him, but whatever he said, I didn't like it. I hung up and I picked up the phone and called the Republican congressman. I didn't know what a Democrat or Republican was. That was Republican Bill Baker. I think that was the last Republican elected you know, official uh, in, in Congress in the Bay Area. And that was in the 90s. What he said, I liked. I went and I volunteered. I ended up running his congressional campaign. And we were one of the most contested you know, races in the country in 94 uh, um, you know, uh, election. And so- in 96. And so I look now where I ran this last um, cycle, I stepped out of politics, went and built my career in business and school. You know, I stepped back in. I didn't know I had gone extinct. I didn't know moderates had disappeared. I didn't know that it wasn't cool to be a moderate anymore. Right. Um, but what I would say is I am bullish on the Republican Party. And it's one reason why I ran now. Um, uh, you know, did I think there was a chance to win? Of course, there's always a chance. The likelihood I knew was probably likely low, but that's just the beginning. The future of the Republican Party is bright because I do believe uh, those on the far right realize they need moderates. Without moderates like me and the people in the middle, the purple, um, the Republican Party will disappear. It's just going to take some time before we come back together. I would Let's just say I would that. just say one I would I would just say one thing to add to that, and I don't I don't mean to interrupt Dr. Forster, but that district again that Valerie's talking about is a suburban district, the district that Republicans used to that used to be the core of the Republican Party, um, urban the the kind of sprawl from urban centers, and it's just it's interesting to see it's just totally illustrative of what Valerie's saying that the Republican Party just can't exist there right now at this moment. I, I take your point. Republicans will be able to exist there at some point. And I think that point might be in the next decade, probably is in the next decade. But right now, she she acknowledges, and I think she's right, It's she's not wasting her time, but certainly understanding the uphill battle she faces in, in, in doing something in a district like that. Of course. Well, look, we, we could spend the whole hour sort of dooming and glooming about the GOP. But, you know, let, let's let's try to take maybe kind of a positive take. And Val, I got another question for you. Um, you know, heading into the 2020 election, I think Democrats were anticipating a sweep uh, in the House, in the Senate, and of course, with Joe Biden being elected president. And as it turns out, House Republicans were actually much more successful in 2020 than, frankly, most political observers expected. They managed to flip 15 seats, including three seats here in you know, very blue California. Yeah. And one interesting fact about those seats is 11 of those seats were won by GOP women. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, given these impressive gains, I, I'm just, as a, a woman candidate yourself, what role do you see women playing in shaping the future of the GOP? Again, I see it as, as an opportunity, right? So what I often say is there are so many Republicans who just don't know it, like I was a long time ago, or Republicans in hiding that don't tell anyone, hey, I'm a Republican too, right? So as you start to have diversity in our Republican party, and it's up to candidates like myself and the others that, that ran to say, I'm gonna, you know, I'm a Republican and I'm gonna tell everyone I'm a Republican, right? And, uh, and so as you start to have this diversity, others that are paying attention to the political party are gonna say, Hey, they have a background like mine. They have a story like mine. Let me let me open my ears to understand what does it even mean about Republican principles. And that's where I say I'm hopeful and bullish on the future because we are going to start to get more diverse. I don't see us getting less diverse. I see us getting more diverse as we become more diverse and we learn more and we open our ears more and we're more accepting. We are only going to start to get uh, you know more of a presence in this country. Uh, let's let's start putting a little meat on the bones of of the state of the future of the Republican Party in terms of you know talking about actual policies. Uh, and Jake, you you have a front row seat to Congress, and you get to see what Republicans are talking about in terms of policy priorities. But you know it may be a little tough to define what the current Republican Party's agenda really is. You know if you go back to, for instance, the 
the, the 2020 convention, they basically adopted the exact same 2016 um, agenda with, with a, a kind of like, and we're, we're all for President Trump's America first, you know, priorities. Right. Um, and, you know, looking today, you know, Trump, he's out of the White House, he's off Twitter. Um, you know, is, is that, do you see a, a new agenda reforming in Congress? Is it up for grabs right now? Or is it still really just Trump's America first? Uh, it, it's it's really Trump's America first. I'm actually leaving tomorrow morning for Orlando, where the House Republicans will be having their policy retreat. Um, and so they'll be talking a lot about this. And and I, I think, the ins again, speaking about incentives, I know I, do, I probably have spoken a little bit too much about incentives, but um, there's only been two elections. So Republicans are going to take back the House of Representatives almost certainly. Um, so they don't really need a, a big policy agenda at the moment, right? They need to just hold on and call Democrats socialists as much as they can and um, and kind of ride the wave of history because there's only been two instances in the last, I think, 150 years where the, the, uh, the opposition party did, from the president did not lose did not win the House of Representatives. Um, but listen, I, I, I've been covering Republicans, congressional Republicans since 2009. And um, I remember this point in 2010, they did have a big policy agenda, which was basically the, 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 the um, government had been spending too much money and for too long and needed to kind of tighten their belt. They don't have that same tight message at this point. I think that to be honest with you, I think it's going to be something like, um, you know, it's tough to say. It really is tough to say. I haven't seen really a cohesive and uh, fully formed policy message out of the Republicans since since Trump left. And by the way, uh, when Trump was in office, um, many of the policy positions that they adopted uh, were traditionally liberal policy positions, big spending. Um, uh, trade policy that was nowhere close to what the Republican Party had been had been preaching for the last thirty or forty years. Um, the only thing that really looked like Republican policy was the the tax cuts in twenty seventeen. So I, I I I it's a good it's a really good question. It's something that I spend a lot of time thinking about and talking to people about, and I don't really have a good answer at this point. Well, you know, speaking of of, of platforms, um, you know, you broke some news, Jake. Um, uh, Friday before last about uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who, of course, you know, gets a lot of attention, has uh, before and after the election, uh, because she was working on uh, creating a new caucus. You know, there's different caucuses that the House can break up into on both sides. Um, you know, we, we know about the Tea Party caucus that became the Freedom Caucus, you know, sort of the most conservative voices in the Republican caucus. And and uh, she made an attempt at, at forming what she called the America First Caucus. And it was just sort of in its infancy. And you guys had circulated uh, a PDF as part of your uh, newsletter that outlined um, what their plans were and what their agenda was. And, you know, there was a lot of things in there that, like, you know, frankly, seemed uh, kind of illiberal and, and uh, racist, you know, references to, quote, common respect for uniquely Anglo-Saxon political traditions. And, the, the response was, was pretty savage on both sides, Republican and Democrat to this. And, and by the time Monday rolled around, uh, she basically backed off of this, uh, even right. though you had indicated uh, a handful of members had already announced that they wanted to join this caucus. So, I, you know, turning to, to you, Val, I, and talking about the future of the Republican Party, I mean, it's pr fairly clear that um, in terms of social media, in terms of attention, in terms of fundraising, Marjorie Taylor Greene and what we could call her America First Caucus, although it's not formed, do seem to represent a possible future for, for the GOP. And I guess I wanted to ask the question, you know, do you see those, you know, her and those who would follow her and their messages of, um, uh, you know, racial superiority or, or other sorts of a liberal sentiments, do you see that as being a, a future part of the GOP? See, I don't. So this is where I say we focus on the extremes, right? So if you were to draw your bell curve, and this is why I talk about being in the purple, you know, who's our president? A moderate, right? He emerged out of this country to win, you know, th this presidency. 
when we talk about people on the left, on the Democratic side or talk on the right, we tend to focus on our extremes. Why? It sells, it's sensational, it's exciting. You know, I was watching Stephen Goldberg last night. He's mentioning Marjorie Taylor Greene. She's one person out of our 200 plus, you know, Republican, you know, uh, House of Representatives. She does not represent the party, but she's exciting. She sells. It's what media wants to talk about. It's what newspaper wants to talk about. But we have to remember, she represents her district. Her district hired her. But the rest of the country doesn't look like that. The rest of the Republicans that are there don't look like Marjorie Taylor Greene. And that's where we have to be really careful. And it makes me angry and upset sometimes because I say that's doing a disservice to the, the average person. Anyone listening to this conversation, I say you're in the you're in the top one percent. You're the political elite. If you're going to take your time to listen to a political conversation, you care. You love it. The rest of the country doesn't care. Right. So they go off of the quick sound bites. And I'd say we have to be careful not to identify these extremes on the left or the right, that that now represents our party, because that's not that's not true. Right. What would you say, Jake? Yeah. So a few things. Um, we've made the conscious decision that um, that uh, uh, outside of very rare um, instances, we're not going to be following around Marjorie Taylor Greene. This is not something we're going to do um, because she's because of the reasons you stated, right? Because she's not representative of the Republican Party. We felt like this was a, a um, an exception because this was an exception, right? I mean, she was, she was basically suggesting, um, I want to be careful what I say, but she was basically suggesting a nativist um, kind of, you know, platform that was not really acceptable. Um, but I, I agree with you. I do agree with you. But listen, I mean, uh, she raised three and a half million dollars. I mean, you know how significant that is. Um, the, the And I, if she hadn't backed away, there were people who were ready to follow her. So the fact that somebody thought to put this caucus in place and to put those those um, um, those principles, they, it's tough to even call them principles, but those priorities on paper um, does indicate a... Um, but it indicates a certain, um, again, I want to be careful what I say here, but a certain kind of um, view of the world that they thought was acceptable to a broad swath of people. And and frankly, if you're if you're from a, dis a, a if you're a Republican from a district that is um, Republican but not overwhelmingly Republican, and you will get questions: Why aren't you with Marjorie Taylor Greene? Why is she doing this and you're not doing this? So that pulls the entire Republican Party to the right. You know, so so it's a tough balance as a reporter to figure out how to how to cover that. My my theory of the case is you cover we cover the leadership and then everything on down. So Kevin McCarthy, Steve Scalise, and Liz Cheney, and um, it's difficult to it, it's just a, it's a difficult decision making process for us. And and how to handle a member like Marjorie Taylor Greene is difficult for us because that those those were nativist and racist principles. So you know anyway. Well, you know it. it it's interesting uh, talking about a freshman congressperson at all, <laughs> because for those of us who, who've been involved in Congress, I worked in Congress 20 years ago, you know, you didn't get paid attention to as a freshman in Congress. And it's sort of extraordinary today how, um, you know, AOC and Marjorie Taylor Greene and, and others have uh, managed to capture so much of the media bandwidth uh, from the positions that they, they occupy. Um, and I, you know, I, I wonder if, if we're seeing a change in the nature of who's running for Congress and how they think of their jobs. Um, there's a book recently by Yuval uh, Levin of the American Enterprise Institute, where he, he's observed a shift in members of Congress on both sides, but it does apply to the Republican Party, uh, I think, in particular. He sees that members are, are increasingly engaged in what he calls performative politics. Mm -hmm. They see Congress as a stage to perform on, but they're they're not very interested in, say, policymaking. You know, they, they don't get down, you know, sort of the, the show horse versus workhorse analogy where those who, um, you know, can, can get quick uh, cable hits and who can get social media attention and generate, generate fundraising appeals, they're the ones who succeed and get ahead right now politically. Whereas those who are more engaged in policy and, poli and, and, and trying to, to change policy, they fall to the back. And so, I mean, Jake, I, I, this question for both of you, but I want to start with you, Jake. How much interest do you actually see among GOP members in policymaking? Well, it's actually, I mean, uh, that's, a, that's a complicated question. Um, a lot, 
in some areas, less in others. And and by the way, the performative nature of politics is not only on the Republican side, um, it's also on the Democratic side. Um, and I so I don't really want to I don't want to I don't want to. It's not a a a, um, a disease that's that's limited to one party. Um, you know, th this is an interesting an interesting way to look at it. Um, it used to be in the in bipartisan deal making is so the power has just been so centralized at the leadership for so long. So this started back in the 1990s with Newt Gingrich and continued with Nancy Pelosi and just it's it's been happening for you know steadily for 20 years where the leadership really holds all the cards. So that makes the, so the the rank and file has to find other ways to keep themselves occupied. And I know that sounds trite, but it's really it, it is really the reason that we see this. And um, I think that that there I think that people have the desire to cut deals and to to legislate, but they just don't have the rope to the, the leash to do it, if that makes sense. Um, I, I, I think there is a desire to work across the aisle, but again, the incentive is not there. So I, I, I don't think I mean, listen, it, I, the name of the game is 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 raising money and winning elections. And to do that, you're not going to get a it's not going to be it's not helpful to cut a deal with a Democrat. Right. I mean, <clears> that's just not what's going to get you there. So, you know, I think it's a complicated question, but I think that's kind of the general, the, the, the general gist of it. So my thing is on this, what I saw again running was there's a certain type of person that, you know, gravitates towards running. So for my campaign, you know, I'd always said when I stepped out of politics, Newt Gingrich was, you know, I met him, I have pictures with him, the contract with America, that's what got me involved in politics in the 90s, okay? So, but, and I had uh, considered running, I was asked back then, would you consider running for office, Val? And I said, I don't have any experience. Why would I run for office? I'm like, you know, young, I'm just finishing college. I haven't seen anything. Let me go see the world and I'll step back in when I can have some experience. And second, when I can afford it. And third, when it's the right time. So the key part was around affording it. So I'm fortunate, came from nothing, built up a successful career. I was able to step back in and I self-funded my campaign. Okay, so I was I was not gonna get distracted with all the money, you know, because I saw that happen to my congressman when we became one of the most contested races in the 90s and everything became about money and you stopped doing things, right? And so what I would say is, you know, what I'm so dis disappointed about and what I noticed was the type of person that runs for Congress now, you have to be a person that sells your soul for the dollar, right? To think that you have to make, you have to raise more money and that's all the media reports on. So even in my race, they would say he outraised you. I go, he's raising money. He doesn't need to spend any money in this district. It's a waste of time. Go do something in Congress. You don't need to raise the money. You can run congressional campaigns on a smaller budget, right? Um, but for whatever reason, that is what gets focused on as performance, as a metric in the media of who raised more, because if you raise more, you're going to win. If that were the case, Bloomberg would be our president. So I sit back and say, let's not give so much attention to how much someone raised. Let's talk about their background, their experience, what they're, if they're qualified, if they're, you know, let's talk about other things, not the show part of the money part. Well, Val, I want to, a follow-up question about that. You know, you just went through the experience of being a Republican candidate and you felt those pressures. You were fortunate uh, to self-fund and, and sort of uh, resist, you know, a lot of pressure perhaps to perform. But, you know, Jake had mentioned earlier that, you know, it doesn't matter the composition of the district, you're always going to have people coming up and asking you, are you with President Trump? And sort of, you know, putting pressure on you to conform to the more performative, you know, MAGA kind of agenda. And I just, you know, as someone who's a purple uh, candidate, you know, how, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with those contradictions and those pressures where all the energy in the party seems to be very far away from where you sit? It's so true. So I try to give the examples. My husband was a CEO of multiple companies, you know, there in California. And the voices, if you go on Glassdoor or other places, it's the loudest voices that take take your emotion, but the least effect in many ways. And so I, when I ran for Congress, you know, I was thinking I would get these calls and people would be yelling and screaming. And I'd say, how many phone calls have you made? You can call and scream and tell me you want all this time of mine, but have you actually gone and done any work? And we had built a pretty powerful technology system to track the performance of volunteers. So what I would say is we have to remember the loudest voices can kind of try to distract and take people's time. But are, how deep are those voices into having an effect on votes, right? Because running for Congress, 
one person and their voice being super loud, there's still just one, one vote. So I always had to remember, let me think about the whole district. Let me think about who I'm not hearing from. Let me think about them first versus the person that's going to call and be so loud in your head. Uh, so that would be my biggest advice if I, you know, if I run again, is not letting people take that emotion, take that from me. And I, I definitely let it take my emotion, right? And, but I won't make that mistake again. Uh, just to remind everyone, if you have questions as we're talking here, please uh, send a private message to uh, Aditya Bala. He's uh, one of the participants, the co-host right now. Um, I, I want to follow up, um, Val and Jake, also um, on this question of, you know, the, the current state of the GOP. Um, you know, some some have been calling. You know, I I, I know Lee Drutman at New America. He wrote uh, a book basically trying to make the case for uh, a multi-party system. He thinks that. The problems that we're facing don't have so much to do with left versus right, but the fact we're locked into two parties. He, in fact, he goes as far as to call our current two-party system a doom loop that is breaking our democracy. But you know, he does raise a question, I think a valid one, maybe an increasingly valid one, uh, Val, maybe for you, in the sense that you know, maybe the, given you know, uh, the fact that Donald Trump has really disrupted the Republican Party, um, you know, Jake was talking about how some assumptions of, of the Republican Party for years and years, you know, since before Reagan have kind of disappeared in four years. Uh, and that the energy in the party has shifted to the right. Um, and in some ways to the left as well. And I'm just kind of curious, you know, you, you're very independent, I think, in the way you present yourself. Um, what about a third party? I mean, is, is that attack for, for Republicans like yourself that, that no longer maybe feel in the center of the party what about starting a new party? Uh, do you see that as a possibility of, of something that could emerge and, and what would it look like? I mean, this has been being tried since the nineties, right? Um, with in, just the independent and that hasn't really happened. So would I want more parties? Yeah, if there's a, a chance to have elected officials represent their voters and that provides you know better access or better, you know, better, you know, more policy to get done in our country, I'm all for it. But what's the likelihood? So I'm also, you know, a pragmatist, right? Like, what's the likelihood of that happening? So I'll defer to Jake. Like my opinion. So I'll give you an opinion. It can only be right or wrong, right? It's two outcomes, right or wrong. My opinion over the next ten years, no, it's not going to happen, um, uh, uh, right? But uh, but could it happen in fifty years? Maybe. Uh, ten years? No, not going to happen. Jake? Yeah, I don't think it's, it's going to happen. I mean, just getting on the. Uh, yeah, I I don't I don't think. Um... I don't think it's going to happen is the short answer to it. Um, we've seen various attempts to make it happen over the last 10 years. Um, and it's just, it doesn't seem likely this is the long and short of it. All right. Well, um, you know, Jake, you kind of gave away uh, the ending in a sense where you said uh, it's a dead cert. Republicans are going to win in 2022. So we'll hold you to that. But I look, that. well, I, I, and I don't mean to say, I mean, there are many things that could happen. 2002, when, our, you know, our nation was just attacked after 9-11, um, uh, people wanted steady leadership. They kept, Repub they kept um, Democrats rather in power. Um, in the House of Representatives, no, sorry, Republicans rather in power in the House of Representatives. Um, could that happen again? Sure, it doesn't seem likely. This, I, I, I want to, I want to apply all appropriate hedges here. So um, <laughs> I, I think it's, I think it's unlikely. Uh, uh, I think it's unlikely. Well, let's let you know. I, I, you know, looking at the past and projecting into the future, it does seem, say, more likely than not, given this the margins right now between the Republicans, and Democrats, and the House, and and the fact that it's a midterm election for the first term of uh, Biden. We, we've talked a bit about an agenda and the fact that you know Republicans are getting together in Orlando. You're going to follow them down there. They're kind of figuring out what their agenda is. What do you think they're going to do? Like if if the if the dog catches the car uh, and the House Republicans are back in charge, what's their agenda uh, for the le the next two years of the Biden administration? Well, with a um, with a Democratic president, um, uh, I don't. I, the answer is, I mean, I lived through 2010 through 2016, which was a very um, tense and um, interesting time in our nation's history. Uh, we The government shut down a, a couple of times. Uh, the nation almost defaulted on its debt. So I don't know. I, I think that um, 
I think that for the first, I think the ne- if Republicans take back the House of Representatives in 2022, it will just be a, um, it will be a lot of uh, fire. It'll be a circus from 2022 to 2024 until there's a presidential election to help clarify the political system a little bit. Um, because Republicans will say, listen, there's a presidential election coming up. We think we're going to win. We're not going, you know, I, whether they say this or not directly, I don't know, but I think that will be the general vibe. Um, and then, uh, so the answer is, I don't, I, I think that's, I think that it's just going to be a lot of a, a huge stalemate. I think that's why you see Joe Biden doing everything he's doing right now. Right. I think mm-hmm. that's why you see Biden just pushing through aggressively an agenda that is, um, um, ambitious. And I know, Valerie, you called, you said he's a moderate and a centrist. He's not been a moderate and a centrist. No. He's been an, an unabashed liberal. Uh, totally. The last, right. The last, yes. That's why the last I think we're going to have a lot of pickups because he seems like he's getting pulled left. He, he is. But you were right in saying he's generally and, and, and traditionally a moderate. He's not been a moderate the last couple of months. Um, so I think that um, that's why you see him pushing everything through right now, because he realizes now is the time to do it. And he saw Barack Obama try to get cooperation and not get cooperation. So Val, let, let's, you know, we've been talking uh, about the whole, the party as a whole. Let's talk about like you, if you were running in 2022, like what would your agenda be? What would your priorities be as a, as a Republican candidate thinking about winning back the house and what the house should do? So this is where I'd say, I go back to when I got involved, you know, 25 years ago, and I still have my flyer from Congressman Bill Baker. And what was it that got me excited to go into his office? First on his flyer was jobs. So right, this is a, as a, you know, being raised in the kind of lifestyle that I was on, that, that was the first thing I wanted to hear when I, when I called my elected official, he was focused on jobs. So my, my platform when I ran was JETS, Jobs, Education, Taxes, and Safety. And it's funny, because I said that to a top Republican strategist. He was like, every Republican says that. Right. So if you think about it on, on certain things of our agenda, that agenda has not changed. And I feel on, on those. That's why every Republican says it. Right. And we all say it, but that's because that, that that's what we, we, we believe in. So you will find if I'm sitting in a room with those who are far right of me and the party here where I ran, the leaders are far right. But they they would say to me, we need you, Val. You're a moderate. Your district here in the North Shore of Chicago, 10 minutes from Northwestern, you know, the shores of Lake Michigan, we need moderates. A far right person will not win in this district, right? And it's been represented by moderates for a long, long time. And so when you look at Republican politics, we agree, I like to say seven out of 10 things. If we go down, I'd get these questions. Seven out of 10, we'd agree. Where would we disagree socially? So I'm a pro-choice, pro-climate, pro-same-sex Republican, right? So I support those, that the kind of the social elements where I go, I'm purple. I will go back and forth based on how parties change. Uh, uh, but the, the, the fiscal side, we agree. Moderates and conservatives will agree. Um, so that's where I'd say our agenda was like that 25 years ago. It's today. But where we differ are on kind of those social, those social components. You know, talking about, you know, Republicans' electoral chances, you know, Republicans since Newt Gingrich have been working on, you know, what was called the gender gap and this idea that, you know, Republicans were not doing well among women generally and that they needed to close that gap in order to be more competitive uh, nationally uh, as a party. And, you know, enter President Trump, who has done a, a pretty terrible job of appealing to women. Um, you know, he... <laughs> You might remember back to October where he plaintively asked, you know, suburban women, will you please like me? Uh, he knew this problem. Uh, he couldn't seem to solve it. And, you know, exit polls show that only about 43 percent of suburban women voted for Trump in 2022. So, uh, Val, you know, as, as a you know, female GOP candidate, I mean, is it possible for Republicans to close this gender gap and, and win with Trump as the head of the party? So Trump is the head of the party, I would say not in the short term, no. And, and again, I'm going from my anecdotal, so maybe Jake has data you know, uh, uh, across the country, but I've lived in California, New York, Illinois, Connecticut, um, you know, Washington, Pennsylvania. I've lived a lot of places. So I've had a chance to meet a lot of different people across this country. And again, this is where I say a long time ago, I would say I was Republican. They were like, great. Now I go into my suburban circles, you know, playing tennis, going to drinks with women. And they're like, 
there's Val, she's a Republican. I was like, I didn't know it wasn't cool to be supportive of, you know, jobs, education, taxes, and safety. Um, so I just think there's a branding issue, right? Where at some point um, we will all say, let's start over. Let, like I say to people, we've hit rock bottom in the suburbs in the Republican moderate party. Guess what? You can't go down anymore. That's my opinion. All we can do is go up from here. That's my opinion. So at some point we will start to go up. The question is when? few years from now, I think it's going to start to go up. It's going to start to slowly go up and then we're going to get some acceleration. That's why I'm bullish over the next 10 years. It used to, we used to say the, um, the, the, the suburban safety, you know, minivan, um, moms, I, there was a better term for it, which I can't remember. Right soccer now. moms. Yeah. Soccer. Yeah. But it was not even soccer moms, but there was a better term that anyway, um, I, I think back to, um, there was a special election in um, in North Carolina. I think it was must have been 2019, uh, 20, yeah, 2019. Uh, Dan Bishop versus Dan something or other, Republican versus Democrat in a seat that Republicans held for a million years. Mm -hmm. And um, George Bush, I think, won the district 70-30. So a, a district that was just solid Republican outside of Charlotte. Uh, a really, really solid Republican district. And uh, the Democrat ran within like three or four points uh, of, of this Republican and nothing changed. The district was the same. It was the top of the ticket, always the top of the ticket that, and it was, it, it was, it, it was just the, all of the kind of what we Jews say, Mishigas, right? It was all of the, the extraneous garbage that mm -hmm. came along with, with Trump. Uh, not the policy, which a lot of Republicans, which, you know, a lot of people didn't didn't have a problem with, but all of the other stuff uh, that distracted from the overall jets, I'll use that in the future message, right? Jobs, economy, taxes and safety. Education, tax and safety, yep. It, it, uh, right, ed, education, um, which is actually a great acronym. I mean, that's what that's what districts like your the one that you ran in in, in Illinois was, you know, for a long time interested in, and I, I grew up in Connecticut. I grew up in Southern Connecticut in Stamford, where mm -hmm. Republicans um, held that seat for from 1987 to 2008, and yeah. uh, held it in a very strong way, a very uh, uh, big way. And uh, Barack Obama came, Democrats won, Republicans could never get it back. Uh, it couldn't even get close in the Trump era. So, so it's, I, I'm not sure it's going to be in the next couple of years. We have to see. I mean, we have to see how active Trump stays in politics. If he runs again or toys with running again in 2024, um, it's just going to set the party back in some of those districts for a lot, for a longer time yeah. in my estimation. Yeah, but that's where I'm, I'm bullish in the blue state. So I say, uh, you know, Democrats mm -hmm. in, in the California's Illinois, New York, you know, Washington, Connecticut, they've kind of taken for granted. They're like, we got this, these states we're, we're good. So now they're taking, they're focusing on the Florida's the Texas. I said, perfect. So this is where I see the opportunities. Now the RNC, you know, they, they have their, like I, we would chat about it and they didn't, they don't see my vision. My vision is there's opportunity in the blue states to get back to being purple. So when I was there in the 90s, we had Republican governor. My congressman was Republican. The state senator, this was Walnut Creek, right? So just east of San Francisco, uh, Washington uh, was, was purple. Uh, Illinois was exactly purple, literally equal, equal in terms of elected officials in Congress between Republican and Democrat. I think we're going to get back to that point over the next 10 years. But Valerie, I mean, I, I would say this. I mean, when you have, and I agree with you, um, but bring it back to to the America First Caucus thing. I mean, there are a big chunk of people in the in in the in the House that are going to go out and say that you know uh, are going to back are going to back principles or at least talk gingerly about principles like um, assimil like we need to assimilate immigrant. I mean, just stuff that's that's in the that you know you're only as good as your as your weakest link, right? That's the, that's the saying in in any kind of large system. And I think that. Um, Republicans need to do a better job of purging their weakest elements is what I would say. Yeah. You know, let's talk a, a little, you know, uh, in a conversation for uh, about Republicans, we haven't made the focal point always about Trump. So it's time, I think, to bring him more into focus and uh, sort of ask the question, you know, do we think he's going to run again? And if so, why hasn't he already announced? Uh, you know, he's he clearly came off of, of his uh, presidency in, in um 
uh, you know, with January 6th and all the, the, the denial about, you know, uh, his losing the election, you know, he dominated this country's politics and media to almost, I think, a point of suffocation uh, through January. And then he sort of disappeared. Like, it's been pretty quiet since then. And I'm just kind of curious. I mean, it's hard to read tea leaves. And I'm certainly one of those people that, you know, the day after the presidential election, when people start talking about the next one, makes me a little crazy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, let's talk about the Trump in the room and why hasn't he already announced? And, you know, is, is he creating a problem for the party in terms of not say, if he's not leaving room for other voices and other candidates to come in and be competitive in 2024? There's no reason to him for him to announce now. I mean, he's still the dominant figure in the party. He could wait until the last minute and every single person is going to defer to him. So the, the, again, the incentive is not there for him to do it. He could get on any show. He could, he'll be able to raise the money, um, leaves his opportunities open, leaves his options open, leaves everything open. He, you know, he's, he's all about the show, right? So the show is, um, is best if there's a cliffhanger. <laughs> I mean, to put it to put it lightly, um, do I think he runs? I have no idea. Um, I had a good enough relationship with him. I um, I uh, uh, interviewed him a number of times for my book, which should be behind my head in some way, <laughs> shape, or form, um, somewhere in that stack of books that that is sitting behind me. Um, uh, I, you know, I just don't know. I think that he, you know. Um, no matter what he does, it's going to be a last minute decision in my estimation. Um, I think it's going to be a, let's make everyone wait. Let's, and, and he'll have, at that point, he'll be the kingmaker, which is really what he wants. Yeah, agreed. Do, do you think though, like, you know, there's a lot of contenders, potential contenders, particularly I think in the Senate, you know, people like Tom Cotton, who I think are, and, you know, uh, Rubio as well, who, you know, are, thinking about running for president. And they're sort of, you know, trying to set the stage for them being contenders in 2024. Do you think Trump by, by sort of, you know, waiting too long could end up being a spoiler and actually ruining chances for a, a viable Republican candidate if he decides not to run? And wouldn't he love that? So he's like, perfect, <laughs> right? I mean, like you were saying before, the show of it, he's like, oh, let's let everyone else announce. Let's let them think about it. And if he decides he wants to, he goes, I'll sit, I'll sit you all down. So this is where I say people have to do their thing. Uh, this, you know, voters have to take on their own responsibility to say, am I going to spend 20 minutes of my day to educate myself on the candidates who are running, who are giving their time to, you know, to public service and to, 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 to care? Right. So this is where you have a small percentage of our country that votes and cares, that reads, that that votes person over party. And that's going to be the future of will the next generation, many of the college students that are listening today, will you get your friends to say, let's let's think of person over party. Let's care. Let's spend a little bit of time reading about these people and reading about who they are. Instead of just showing up and being like, let me do D all the way down or R all the way down, and I have no idea who they are, what they represent, right? And that has to change. That would be, a, if Jake, if you had a solution for that, that's where I sit back. When is that gonna change in this country? It's not. It's I not. Mean, I it's, yeah, and I, I don't mean to be grim and, and be negative about that. Um, most voters are relatively low information voters, and that's not a that's not a pejorative. That's just a, a reality. Most people vote party. Um, most people don't have the time and only tune into elections in, you know, after after Labor Day of the year of the election. And at that point, the, you know, candidates are trying to do what they have to do to get the biggest vote total they could get, you know. Um, and um, it's unfortunate, I guess, to a, to a degree, but um, it, it is what it is. And that's kind of what I'm not sure there's a way to change that. I'm with you. Yeah. I agree. Too bad. Well, we've got about 10 minutes left here. Let's turn to some questions from uh, our audience. Um, first one uh, is for Val. Um, it's a question about, about your experience as a candidate. Um, uh, basically, what this person would like to know is, you know, what were the internal party mechanisms? Like, how did the, the RNC or the NRCC support your campaign or, in some cases, not support your campaign? Yeah. How, so how did you find that whole 
infrastructure working or not working for you? I'll tell you here in my district. So our local leader, Mark Shaw, I had two counties in my district. Mark Shaw was the co-head of our state here, the state here in Illinois, because the example was he's on the right, but the previous um, Illinois GOP leader was a moderate and they realized they need both. So they had come together, right? And had a and co-head um, of, our, of our state. And he fully embraced me, fully supported me, no, even though we don't, we didn't agree on everything. And, uh, and so I really relied on my local leaders. Now, then you have one level down from the local leaders and he is a worker, he's a workhorse and cares. One level down, a lot of people appear that they're in leadership, they do zero work. And my background coming from banking and tech, like you have to perform and everything's, you know, there's metrics. And I was super surprised on how much talk there was. This is what I talked about before. And there was no action. There was nothing behind it. And I'd say, how are we going to win if no one works? If we just sit around in a group of people and agree with one another, what's the point of that? It's a waste of our time, right? And so, and then for the, you know, NRCC and the RNC, I said no to help. So I'm one of the candidates probably, I don't know if anyone else has done that. But I said, I don't want it. I don't want national help. If I'm a Republican who believes in local and wants things returned to the local community, why would I want to give up power to you in DC? You don't know my district. You don't know my voters. You don't know my volunteers. Um, and so what I would say is uh, if for those who ever consider running, you got to think, don't just get excited about, you know, showering of praise or showering of attention because people seem cool or it seems cool to get attention from DC. Is it going to help you win or is it going to help you lose? And I assessed it would help me lose. It would not add value to me. It would actually take away value to, from me. Um, Jake, it's a question for you, but uh, Val, you're welcome to, to weigh in as well. Uh, another question about Republicans and policy. Uh, we've seen some moves by some key Republicans to appeal to, you know, a more working class kind of voter. Uh, you know, you can see that as the party's changed, uh, you know, we have less college educated voters voting for Republicans. Uh, Trump has sort of changed the character of, of who's turning out. And now we see some maybe Congress people responding to that. You see, you know, Tom Cotton supporting a minimum wage. You see Marco Rubio talking about workers' rights and supporting workers. And just wanted to Ask this question: you know, Do we do we see Republicans in Congress trying to shape policy in 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 reaction to who they see their their voting blocks being? Yes, I, I think we do. Um, that came from Trump, as you as you noted. Um, you know, I never in a million years thought, I, and I tweeted this. I rem, I'll, I'll never forget this tweet. Um, at the end of Trump's term, uh, uh, I think after the election. Um, when Trump proposed the payroll tax holiday, another payroll tax holiday, so a break from payroll taxes, which is which funds uh, Social Security and funds a whole, you know, uh, a, a large, a large social safety net program. Um, and members of Congress were more interested in sending checks to people. And I said at that time, I said, I never thought I would see this that Republicans are more in favor of sending checks out to people than they were in, 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 in favor of cutting a tax, which is, is remarkable. Um, so I think that, um, and look at Josh Hawley. I mean, Josh Hawley, Republican Senator from Missouri, I don't think you mentioned him, Dr. Corser. I think um, you mentioned Cotton and Rubio, but um, Josh Hawley, I always, I always give his, his staff flack for this, but I mean, he is not a Republican. I don't know what he is, but the, the the viewpoints that he represents are not. He might call himself a Republican. He doesn't represent a a traditionally Republican point of view, um, and I think we're seeing this new form of Republican that tries to appeal to some of these. Um, I don't know. I guess working class is one way to say, but some of the Trump kind of coalition, which expects a large and um, active federal government. I mean, that's the only way to say it. And and that is not the traditional Republican Party that, I mean, I don't know if you agree, Valerie, but that is not the Republican Party that I grew up knowing. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't say this often publicly. I voted for George Bush. I, I was a, you know, a, a college Republican. So I, I, I've lost all my political leanings because I think everyone, as I said at the beginning, is crooked um, and I hate everyone equally. But um, that's not the Republican Party that I grew up knowing that a, a it, it was more a, a keep out of my way, 
so I'm curious what you think, Valerie, about this, because I, that kind of Repu that's not a Republican point of view, sending checks to people and that strong kind of active federal government. Agreed. So this is where I go back to that JETS framework. So when I, when I went to work for my congressman, it was jobs, it was education. So I grew up in San Pablo, you know, metal, metal detectors in my high school. You know, I, I, can, I wish that I could have gone to a better school, but, you know, my mom couldn't afford it. So this is where I, I loved what, when I went into the congressman's office, he supported school vouchers. So Steve Forbes was running for president there. I was like, vouchers, I, you're telling me I could go to a better school where there's not gun, you know, metal detectors in my school. Taxes, that's more for, uh, you know, that, that wouldn't have been something I would have worried much about unless you told me we reduce taxes, you're going to get a better job. Okay, you tell me, uh, my focus was jobs and education and the last was safety. You know, I grew up, my house was broken into. I went to bed every night. I would pray. I tell the story. I'd pray, please, I, I don't want to be stolen tonight, right? Because my neighborhood was scary. Like I couldn't walk outside. I had to be careful when I walked places. The last was safety. And so when we talk about working class families, again, like mine, where I grew up in my extended family, jobs, education, attack, reduce taxes, give me a better job and give me a safer neighborhood. That's the Republican principles. I think we lead there. We will win on those four, you know, on those four pieces. But we get distracted by the other stuff. Are you pro-choice or pro-life? That's the first question I get, right? Are you pro-Trump or against Trump? Um, and uh, are you pro-guns or, you know, against guns? Those are the three questions that people ask instead of freaking focusing on what do we lead? What are we the best at in its jets? I've got a couple of questions I'll kind of combine together here. Um, some have noted, you know, that Republican opposition to the last COVID relief bill was fairly muted that, you know, the RNC basically sent out a couple of press releases after the bill was passed even. Um, and questioning sort of like what the Republican Party is doing in terms of opposing it. You know, there, there was a few people who pointed out that Kevin McCarthy was talking more about Dr. Seuss than he was talking about the, the, the bill that was, uh, you know, trillions of, of dollars. So, you know, Republicans seem to be pulled, you know, more establishment Republicans, maybe like a Mike Murphy keeps talking about, you know, uh, the waste and, and size and concern over spending that Biden is proposing with his infrastructure bill. But yet we've got Marjorie Taylor Greene and a lot of other Republicans who, frankly, seem more energetic part of the party that want to talk about cancer, cancel culture and want to talk about cultural issues. And so, you know, heading into, you know, 2022, which side's going to win here? Is it going to be, you know, the cancel culture warriors, or is it going to be sort of the more, more old guard, you know, green eye shade Republicans that you guys are seem to be pining for? And this is where I say Republicans have a hard time. I tell like my kids, if, I, if I'm on the Democrat side, particularly the progressive, and I tell you everything is going to be free, anything you want's free, and guess what? You're never going to pay for it. That person over there is going to pay for it. That is a hard message to try to get on the other side. And the Republicans say, but no, but we can't afford it. Well, yes, you can, right? And so this is what's going to be really interesting as we go through the next few years with this pull to the left and the right, which are the exciting, the extremes, who's going to pay attention? And are we going to be able to rely on that middle voter, that purple voter that will go left or right, that's going to say, let me get rid of all the noise and truly think, What's reality, right? Uh, so, so that's my. Uh, that's what, Jake. What would you say? Um, I, I generally agree with that. I mean, I would say on the on the COVID piece, just to answer the first part directly, um, the general argument was that um, McConnell, what McConnell said, and what Kevin uh, McCarthy said was. We're not in 2020 anymore. We don't need the amount of spending that we needed in 2020. We're on the the backside of this pandemic. Let's do everything you want to do, but let's do less of it to Democrats. Um, uh, that 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 didn't ring true to people. I mean, people really felt like this is a crisis. Republicans can never really coalesce around a message of here's what we would do differently. Like Pelosi said this, and she was. She was right to a certain degree. She's like, so what will you, what do you want to take out of this? Do you want to, um, do you want to remove, um, you know, children's health care? Is that the thing you want to drop from this bill? Do you want to drop, you know, food for hungry people? So it came to a point where like everybody was getting a piece of the pie and everyone needed a piece of the pie and you couldn't really oppose anybody who had a piece of the pie. Um, so to answer your larger question, um, 
what Valerie said is right. I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you split that baby, so to speak? And I don't know that there's a good answer to that. Um, I just don't, I don't know how you do that if you're a Republican, or if, I, I just don't know how do you, how you explain that and how you message it. And we're going to explode. Like when I stepped out of politics, I know we're coming up on the end, but the book that uh, Newt Gingrich and others, I think we were at about a six trillion, um, uh, you know, deficit. What are we at now? 27, 20, 29, 30 growing from here. We're going to explode in this country. But the average person that's voting doesn't understand that or, or realize that. And writing these gigantic checks, of course, it's fun. Who doesn't like writing checks? I like writing checks. When it's someone else's money, my money, I don't want to spend it. Right. So when is that going to stop? And that's just what uh, what I hope. Who, who knows? Uh, so that's why I hope Republicans can get elected so we can get focused back on on, on the topics that that. You know, we get focused back on spending and we're doing a poor job. Like we've been in the writing the checks as well. We got to stop. Thanks everyone to the audience for uh, their attention and their questions. Uh, we're up, we're at the top of the hour, but I have one last question. I, I, I assume maybe uh, that there might be some in the audience who might be cheering the decline of the Republican party, that they see uh, it's a liberal tendencies. They were shocked and appalled by Donald Trump. You know, they may see that they're, are some salv salvageable parts of the Republican Party, but you know, to see it go away, they they, they would like it to happen fast, and and they see it as as a problem to, in American politics. And so, last question I want to ask is, uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi, Jake, you're just mentioning her. She actually says from time to time that she wants a strong Republican Party. Like she actually feels like what she's coming up against in Washington and in the House is actually hurting her and hurting her party and hurting the country. And it's sort of a strange thing to hear from Nancy Pelosi, but I, I guess I, the final question is, you know, you know, what are the dangers to one party governance and, and should, why should we want to have a strong opposition in America? I'm not sure Nancy Pelosi actually believes that, but um, <laughs> let's assume that she does believe it for a second. I've, I've been covering Nancy Pelosi for a long time, so I know she says that. Um, the dangers are, um, if you have a Republican party that's so, um, I don't want to say bizarre, but so centered on the far right of the party, um, the extremes on the left of the political spectrum look normal. I, I, that, that's a, a bad way to explain it. And I, I wish I could explain it better. But um, if you have a, a, a Republican party that is so nativist, that is so, um, outside of the mainstream of general of the general contours of our political party um it doesn't help bring policies to the middle of the country to, to where the middle of the country is i think is the i guess that would be what i would say I, i'm curious what what you think valerie i mean what it, I think it, the dangers would be look at california look at new york look yeah. at illinois it yeah. has become a one-party system so again when i stepped out you know after uh, um, our my congressman lost went and worked and got some you know, education, worked in banking, tech, didn't really pay attention much to politics. I stepped out, okay? I stepped back in and we became one party system in those states. Look what happened. Look at the danger, complacency, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the problems that I, when I, when I hear about, when I watch Bill Maher on Fridays, the, what's happening in California, that's where I'd say we, we have to have balance. You have to have someone in the middle that says, no, I can't always agree with you. We got to get to compromise. We got to think about this other side. So it is, it, I, I think hopefully voters will eventually say that we don't want one party. We need to be split. It's like a mom and dad. I need the mom to say yes, the dad to say no. We come to a compromise because we'll get better outcomes if we do that. Well, Jake, Val, thanks so much uh, for your excellent answers in this discussion. And thanks again to uh, Dave and everyone at the Pomona Student Union for helping to organize it. And also, also of course, thanks to our audience who, uh, stayed with us and gave us some great questions. Good. Well, hopefully some will run and you guys will be our elected officials. And, uh, and it was nice to meet everyone. Thank you for having me. And we'll see you on Capitol Hill if you ever get there. <laughs> Not you, Valerie, but everybody else. <laughs> and and me you too. too for that I hope so. I want to serve. I want to give back. So some point in the future, I hope I'll be able to join someone here as well. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you Thanks. All. And Aditya, I.O. stay. Um, and, and our 